Did you hear that? Can y'all get a police officer for my oldest son in Columbia? What about Buster? What about Buster? Can y'all get a police officer for my oldest son? Buddy, can y'all get a police officer for my oldest son in Columbia? That's Buddy Hill, the sheriff. And they want to come in here and tell you he wasn't concerned for Buster's safety? Once again, I'm grateful Colleton County Sheriff's Department had body cams. Now you know. You know Alec was concerned. You know Alec asked for a police officer for his son in Columbia, Buster. Now I'm almost, I'm almost, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, but I do want to talk about Alec's misstatements about time. Alex told um, Deputy Owen during the interviews that, well, first, Alex's statements about time are not lies. They were just misstatements. And, and, and even, like I said, um, Deputy Owen says people make mistakes about all the, Agent Owen, I'm sorry, Agent Owen, they make mistakes about time all, all the time. And, and they do. Now, Mr. Waters is critical because Alex was wrong every time he gave a time estimate. Turns out, I think Mr. Waters is probably right about that. Whether the time period is inconsequential or consequential, he's wrong about it. And the um, and, and and we had brought in, you know, Alec had told um, deputies in an interview that that he got home at five o'clock, and that's not true. That he went to work that day at eight thirty, and that's not true. And and that um, and, and so he is just wrong on times but what was consistent whenever he had an interview he said you get the records you get the records and it will show what time I was did this what time I did that it will all be in the records I, and, and and guess what they are in the records and and when the records show that his time estimate was wrong you know they jump up and down they jump up and down the, um, the, uh, the the statement to uh, Deputy Green, he says, I've gone, to my mo I've gone to my mom's for about an hour and a half, and, and I last saw them 45 minutes. Now, that, that I don't know. I Frankly, Frank, don't know if that's wrong or not. I mean, he's talking to Deputy Green about 1030. Um, hour and a half from 1030 is 9 o'clock. I mean, he left. He left at 9, you know, he left at 9.07. Um, but that's that. The um, question about what he did when he um, got down to the scene, and he, and he said he, he ran up to Paul and Maggie, and, and he left his phone, and then went back to get his phone, and um, and, and that, and then he's talking to the 911 operator, and you can hear it, and, and he says. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Um, he doesn't remember the sequencing, and I don't think anyone should hold that against him. Um, you know, Mr. Waters gets up here and says, Maggie was running to her baby. Alec was running to his baby. And can you imagine what he saw? And is it evidence of guilt that he doesn't remember what the sequencing was in that moment? Is that evidence? Is that evidence of guilt? Or is that evidence of trauma? This is a guy that then went to get a 12-gauge shotgun and he put 16-gauge shells in it. He knows the difference, but he didn't know that night. And I'm not quite understanding what the state makes of this. Did he not go up to their bodies? Because the forensic evidence sure speaks to the contrary. What we have is Maggie's DNA all over his T-shirt. And you heard that from 
Agent Zapata. We have Paul's DNA on his T-shirt. How did he get Paul and Maggie's DNA on his T-shirt if he didn't touch them? If he brutally murdered them, hosed off down there next to their dead bodies, got in the golf cart butt naked, drove to the house, changed clothes, went over to his mom's, goes down, calls 911, um, and then searches for Whaley restaurant menu and, and checking emails, waiting for the police to show up. How does he get their DNA on his body? Because it's on there. The forensic lab tells you that. Because he went up to them and touched them. And then there's a spot of blood on the suburban uh, steering wheel that was Maggie's. And we know that the suburban was never down at the kennel, thanks to the OnStar information. Thanks. To, uh, I'm not sure that was an accepted fact until OnStar sent their stuff in. But the suburban never went down to the kennel until after he returned back from Moselle. So we know the blood got on the steering wheel after he checked Maggie like he said he did on the 911 call. And then there's a spot of blood on the gun that he went to get. And then there's GSR. There's GSR. There's three particles of GSR on his shirt, three particles of GSR on his shorts, and one on his finger. And, and the sled agent testified that's consistent with transfer GSR when you, when you pick up a gun. So, but really, we're back to the lie. We are back to the lie. Because um, that's all they have in this case, is that Alec lied to them when he was, when he last saw them. And he, and he shouldn't have. And he shouldn't have. And he said, what a tangled web we weave once we start to deceive. And once he lied the first time, he had, was stuck with the lie and he continued to lie. And he shouldn't have. He shouldn't have. And he told you, you know, what was going through his mind. Probably wasn't rational, but he was in the throes of an addiction, and he just found his wife and son murdered. And he's being interviewed. He'd been swiped for GSR. And he does think David Owen is the guy that, that investigated his friend. Um, but he was wrong. He told you. Turns out he was wrong. But I thought that's who it was that night. And he was under investigation. He was being accused of obstructing the boating accident investigation. And he was under investigation by SLED for that. And he had all these skeletons in his closet. And he was wanting to get them away from him and looking for the real killer. The state in this case has gone to lengths trying to, through a sleight of hand, uh, convince you of this and show you that and w without convince you of guilt, without showing evidence of guilt, convince you that he murdered his wife and son because of financial misdeeds were going to come out, um, which is about the most illogical thing imaginable, and there's no evidence of that. And, th and then the state brings all these shotguns in here, and I'm, I'm not going to pick every one of them up, um, but the forensic evidence on these shotguns is they have well, they can't be excluded. Well, okay. They can't be included either, so you know nothing more about these shotguns than you would have the day you showed up for jury selection. Because there's nothing to know about them. Can't exclude them, can't include them according to them, but we do know there's no blood, guts, brains on any, on any of the guns that would have been there from the shooting under everybody's interpretation of how Paul was murdered. The, the, I mean, they want, they, they want you to think that because you own guns that you should be viewed differently I don't know what else to make of that. I don't know what else to make of that. When this
this trial began with opening statements on January 25th, Mr. Arpulian asked why. Why? Why would Alex execute his wife and son in cold blood? And here we are, six weeks later. And you've heard weeks of testimony about Alex's financial crimes, drug addiction, and lies. But after all that, the state has failed to prove, to provide a satisfactory answer to this question. Why? 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 The state cannot provide an answer to this question because the answer is he would not. He would not, under any circumstances, murder those that meant the most to him. Your oath requires that you hold the state to the exacting standard of proof that the state must prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> and when they rely solely on circumstantial evidence, these circumstances must be consistent with each other and when taken together point conclusively to the guilt of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt, and if they merely portray the behavior of the defendant as suspicious, you must find him not guilty. The state's evidence fails to meet these requirements. Circumstances don't point conclusively to Alex's guilt. Far from it. Mr. Waters wants you to believe that Alex slaughtered Maggie and Paul on June 7th and repeatedly lied and changed his story to fit the timeline and evidence. As it turns out, as it turns out, in fact, the state is the one that's been manipulating evidence to fit, fit their theories of guilt, which changed over time from the date of these murders until yesterday. In the absence of forensic science, a reliable investigation, the guns, blood spatter, the time and opportunity to have committed these murders, you're instead left to make inferences about all sorts of interactions and behaviors. Prosecution wants you to view the evidence through the diabolical monster lens that they have tried to paint, but the law requires you to view it through the lens of innocence, where none of these things, individually or taken together, prove conclusively to Alex's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> Up until now, you've not been able to say a single word. Can't imagine how frustrating that must be. But soon, Soon you will have the most powerful voice in this courtroom. With your words, you can let everyone know that in a court of law, only evidence and the burden of proof matters. Not gossip, innuendo, opinions, and most of all, not theories layered on top of speculation. With your words, you can let the state know that they don't get to obtain an indictment by misleading a grand jury and then bring you bef before you a case built on theories, speculation. There are two words that justice demands in this case, and those two words are not guilty. The oath you've taken in this case is to follow the law, to follow the Constitution, and to hold the government to the burden of proof. And it requires a verdict of not guilty. On behalf of Alex, on behalf of Buster, on behalf of Maggie, and on behalf of my friend Paul, I respectfully request that you do not compound a family tragedy with another. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll send you to the jury room for a break. Please do not discuss the case. Everyone will be seated. So, uh, Mr. Meadows, are you closing on behalf of the state? Yes, sir. Um, do you have an estimated length of time that you might go? No more than 40 minutes. Uh, you ready to go? Um, 